Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's so nice to see so many people um, join us for this uh, reintroduction to a project that has been with us for three years now, right? So um, Black Drones in the Hive opened originally in 2020. And if we all kind of reach way back into our memories to remember 2020, it can be a little bit fuzzy. But I remember, um, I remember working on this project because it changed everything for me, and I know it changed a lot for Deanna, too. And it was a project that was essentially born out of conversation, out of, um, out of invisibility, in, out of a search for evidence, um, and a deep desire to see uh, a reimagining of what our public trusts look like. And so when I talk about public trust, I think about our collections, our archives, um, the museums that we care for and that we attend uh, that are designed to tell a story of what we value enough to remember. It's a project that's also about absence in a way and about the stories that are not told in our collections. And for Deanna and I, um, you know, I think we, we share a, a desire to see it's like ventriloquism. <laughs> I'm over there, I'm throwing my voice. Um, looking for signs of blackness in archives, like where, where is the evidence of a, a history that we know or, or we've lived or heard from ancestors. Um, and of course in 2020, it was also a period where collectively many of us were reconsidering you know, how we choose to remember, what our monuments are serving, whose history, whose memory they're serving. And so all of this was happening as we were cooking up this project and presenting it, or cooking up a project that we were hoping someone would see at some point, because so many of our institutions were closed. Um, I know Deanna has a lot to say too about what this project is and where it came from, but, um, but I wanted to, I want to thank Deanna, actually, for the gift of being able to be with this project for so long and to, you know, over the course of three years, work with different teams to share uh, this project. So, you know, before we move along, I want to really extend uh, gratitude to the team at Kamloops uh, for realizing this iteration for us. So, you know, uh, the whole team has chipped in to make this happen. But our uh, prep team in particular, I want to extend gratitude to, head, headed by Matthew Tremblay, and um, Emily Hope, and Charo Neville, and Christina Hallowell. Uh, you all contributed so much to this presentation, so I'm grateful for that. And I know Deanna is grateful too. Um, and Deanna and I had a chance to walk through this show this morning together, or this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's going to do most of the talking. But we always have this moment where we walk through the show and think, this is a lot. And so I, you know, I want everyone to keep that in mind as they spend time with the show, that you don't have to get it all at once. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to be able to move through and investigate on your own and collect your understandings over time. So that's... Uh, that's something that we're going to, to ask you to commit to over the next couple months. So Deanna, I'm going to pass it on to you. She always sets me up like that. Um, <laughs> what am I going to say? Um, for me, the show is uh, part of an ongoing journey that's been the last 30 years of my practice of tracing my family's history and trying to find a connection or an understanding of the things that they went through that they didn't want to speak about. Um, and figure out a way to get around the family silences. That's how it began, anyhow, was um, knowing that I came from, I was part of a very deeply Southern-oriented family uh, that came across into the country in the 19, early 1900s, 1910s. And the work's been about tracing how we came here, what are the things that made us who we are, what are the things that they wanted to keep um, to themselves as a generation that was had an eye towards the future and what they wanted the next generations to know about or not know about. So 
The work's about that. Um, it's also about being very responsive to the communities that support the work. And so even though my practice is very much about my family, it obviously doesn't look as like it. When you get into the exhibition, you'll see. It doesn't look anything like a very intimate, you know, black family story, and yet it is, yeah? Um, I'm thinking about the history that was, is Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, if you were to go to Kitchener-Waterloo, you wouldn't know that it was a stop for the Underground Railroad. You wouldn't know that it was surrounded by another 30 other black communities that are since erased. Um, and you, weren't, you wouldn't certainly think about the relationship between that and the indigenous communities in Six Nations, and then of course uh, the white Canadian art canon that we've come to know as the Group of Seven and those type of painters. You wouldn't think that there would be an interconnection between the lot, and yet there is. And so this is what the show brings forward. Again, it's a way for me to understand what my great-grandparents would have experienced when they got here. What was the community like? What was the world in Canada like? My grandparents, again. And so you will see photographs of my family in the show, um, and that's really as a means for me to better understand who they were. Um, and perhaps from that, um, if you can see yourself or your family in the show um, in any kind of way, either through remembering when your family came to the country or what they experienced, um, this is an opportunity just as much for you to see your own community or potentially your own family members in history and to have a sense of how we all came together to be in this place. How's that? Thank you for reminding us that this isn't specifically about Kitchener. Because I think sometimes people might see a project like this and think, oh, it, it's very regional. But the beauty of the project is that it, it functions as a bit of a microcosm for what we know is existing elsewhere in the country. Um, the way that we design the show is in a series of chapters. So when we walk through the exhibition, we'll, we're going to pause at certain areas. We won't go through the whole story, obviously, uh, tonight, but I think it's worthwhile to maybe start by drawing our attention to double consciousness, which is the, the more concise constellation that's just off to my right here. So there are two uh, framed works. Uh, these two images that we've kind of placed together, or Deanna, that you've grouped together, that we think of as a kind of preamble for how the exhibition has been constructed. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I forgot all of my great brilliance from when I was thinking about it in 2020, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I should mention that, again, the construction of the show came, apart, came about in the COVID context, and so a lot of this material in the show was purchased on eBay, or found on online archives. I wasn't able to go to anything in person, so everything is just something that I've sourced online, which is weird to think about it. So when you get into the, into the body of the show and you see the things that I've collected, it would seem odd that you would be able to purchase these things. But nonetheless, uh, these two images on the left, uh, my left, uh, is uh, the death of Uncle Tom. Um, and that, of course, is in relationship to Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, most people don't know that Uncle Tom is actually a Canadian figure, a, a gentleman named Josiah Henson who actually lived in the Kitchener-Waterloo region uh, and created a settlement called the Dawn Settlement. Um, um, what's her name? Harriet Beecher Stowe cribbed his life story and then went on to write the Uncle Tom narrative that we all know. That was then made into that bad Disney show. But anyhow, <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with that and look at that as one kind of possible way in which black bodies had been represented in that time frame. Largely the deeply loyal slave that dies in the arms of the benevolent white owner that he, or the white master. So thinking about that on the one hand, and then on the other hand is an image uh, illustrated by a gentleman named, um, thank you, Thomas Nast, I was going to lose him. Um, and it's just an, a depiction of Emancipation Day once slavery was abolished in the United States and, the, and this pictorial that was created to illustrate this emancipation of the black slave and all the experiences that they've gone through prior to that moment. Um, and just really thinking that those are the two ways in which the black body is acceptably, is, 
are those are the ways that are most acceptable in representing them, either being saved from um, slavery, but again, a white benevolent kind of a structure that somehow releases them, and of course, the other having the benevolent slave master and dying in his arms. It's not much room for anything else to go on in that narrative, right? It still amounts to death either which way you go, and so we're kind of looking at it as a kind of a death loop of kind of redemption and then ultimate death and coming, going back around in circle and circles. So that, in my mind, was this thought of like, these are the possible ways in which a black person could be seen in this time frame, which again is the opening of the door of how my grandparents would have been able to walk the, worth, or walk the world or my great grandparents. These are the possibilities that were, were there for them. So that's what I was interested in when I put them there, and that seemed like an apt beginning to kind of talk about the rest of the kind of black experience in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, but then moreover, it's just a conversation about what was possible for black people in North America overall. So the title of those two works together is Double Consciousness, and that title is a nod to, um, nod to a theory or a, a proposition put forward by the black intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois. And in, in this kind of shorthand for that, um, that idea, that theory is that to be black is to experience a kind of uh, conundrum in representation. So you are constantly grappling with the representation of yourself and your value that's authored by someone who doesn't know who you are, or specifically, you know, white authors um, painting a picture of what uh, a black existence might be like. So that's where we can see there being a, a kind of connection to the Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's narrative um, uh, trope, right? But, you know, it's also an important way for us to think about the whole project that is this show, which is that most of these images, almost all of them, are drawn from public archives. So this could be, in a way, uh, a representation of what not only uh, black perseverance may look like, but uh, indigenous perseverance, power, all told through, uh, through the authorship or the eyes of, of people who have positions of power within archives, which historically have not been uh, black folks or indigenous folks. So there is a bit of a conundrum in, in putting together a show like this, too. Um, in this space that we're in, we have uh, two uh, works that are in conversation with one another. We have the eugenics constellation on that far wall, and we have a folly of a monument that was built by um, the preparator, then preparator at the Kitchener-Waterloo Art Gallery, Brittany Soster. And it's modeled on uh, a monument, a pedestal for a monument that once stood in Victoria Park in Kitchener, Ontario. And, you know, most cities across Canada have some form of name recognition for monarchs in their cities, right? They have a Victoria Avenue, <laughs> they have a Victoria Street, or they have an Albert Street Bridge. In Regina, where I live, I'm basically living at the corner of Victoria and Albert. So, you know, most of us cannot escape these modes of commemoration that don't really seem to have the same kind of value anymore. And yet, you know, how much intervention does it take before we decide we want to change what the value of those um, commemorations are? You have like a year like 2020 where people decide collectively these models may not work for us anymore. And in Kitchener in 1916, there was such a moment, right, where there was a decision made by you know a few uh, a few more than a few people in the community, that having um, having the bust of uh, of Wilhelm the first in the center of the city was was not the kind of look the city was going for, and so this bust was stolen a couple of times. The second time when it was gone for good, uh, it then precipitated the demolition of this monument. So. You know, we were thinking about how do you kind of uh, create a placeholder for a moment in time when there's no records either uh, to, um, to help you rebuild something like this. So we essentially reverse engineered it from 
a, a single photograph in the archive. There were no measurements, but we tried to imagine what kind of space that might take and chose to render it almost like a folly or uh, a shadow of itself. But it's in relation to another conversation on the wall there that I think Deanna can speak to a little bit. So eugenics, I mean, at the end of the day, really the show all pretty much centers around Queen Victoria. Um, grandmother of Europe, um, many have said, uh, obviously through the intermarriage of her children to other royal families. And we forget that Queen Victoria is of German lineage by nature of her marriage to Albert. And so culturally, the monarchy, the British monarchy in many ways is more of a German thing than it is inherently a, a quote unquote British phenomena. So I was interested in her um, and the ways that her ideas travel uh, around the globe in that time frame. And in the late 18s and the early 1900s, eugenics, um, anthropometry, uh, what else have we got? There's a whole bunch There's of, a whole bunch of phrenology. phrenologies, of reading of the bumps on the heads, all this kind of stuff that was going on that was working as a means of classification so that particular individuals would be weeded out of a community or out of the culture and others would not. Needless to say, black bodies were part of that and in the Kitchener-Waterloo area in particular, um, there was uh, a house of industry and refuge, the Water Waterloo House of India um, Industry and Refuge, better known as a poor house, better known as an insane asylum, a, mu a bunch of things and really, when you think about the transition from human labor, which is you know slavery and that type of thing, and moving into industrialization, there is, a, in my perspective, perhaps not scientifically proven, but in my perspective through the research, there's just like this curious overlapping of these scientists, these pseudosciences around the culling of particular bodies that happens when industrialization comes in. And it particularly plays out at the House of, uh, of Industry and Refuge. There are a lot of black bodies, a lot of quote unquote feeble-minded individuals, um, people that were poor, uh, unable to labor, and so they were classified as a group of people that needed to go to that, that uh, House of, in, of Refuge. Um, and so we have a list of the classifications of uh, ideal kind of characteristics of what a good person would be, and then of course characteristics of the things that would warrant the uh, extraction of an individual from, from society. And then that plays next to, of course, uh, an examination of an African bushwoman's brains, again, in that kind of ongoing science of trying to determine the distinctions between blacks and whites. Um, it overlaps with uh, the introduction of um, Bertillon's system, the photographic system, where it was a former police officer in, in France who believed that photographs and, can, and charting the characteristics of individuals would help one prove uh, or, or be able to spot a criminal. I flag it here with a case of the portraits of two Will, Will, William Wests, who are in fact two black gentlemen who look exactly alike, the same names, in, um, incarcerated in Leavenworth at the same time, but they are very different people. But if you were to follow that Bertillian strategy of classifying of, of criminals, this thing undoes the whole, this whole phenomenon undoes that. Really, I guess what I'm thinking about is that these sciences that are being used to classify us actually are prone to fault. Um, another image, uh, the, Puck, the Puck magazine, eugenics makes the world go round. Again, it really just kind of reflects the psychology and the mindset of empire in the earliest uh, 20th century. And then, of course, there's a false portrait of Wilhelm I, who I should mention is related by marriage or blood? I think it's by blood to Queen Victoria. So again, this is kind of a bit of an incestuous kind of a network, which, you know, if you want to talk about Queen Victoria marrying her first cousin, that obviously introduce, introduces that conversation around a, around a weak bloodline through her marrying her own cousin. So she became a hemophiliac and the Queen Victoria's family was also very weak uh, uh, over subsequent generations. And so this conversation about racial purity really has kind of been put on the wrong bodies, so to speak. And so I wanted to name that as it related, of course, to this and the falling of, um, of an empire. Yeah? Okay. So in this room, we have the highest concentration of images, I think. 
In general, in total, I guess, the exhibition includes over 100 images. So when I say you need to give it time, <laughs> I'm not lying. There's a lot of text in these images too. And so you'll notice right away, we don't have labels explaining it all on the wall for you. And that's because to kind of get a sense of what the connective tissue might be between these constellations, you need to spend a little time reading the images. So, you know, the constellation that's immediately across from me here is titled Berlin, and it includes various articles and uh, reproductions of images that relate to the Waterloo House of Industry and Refuge that Deanna was speaking of. Um, there's uh, there are reproductions that introduce you to a man named Levi Carroll, who was a resident at the House of Industry Refuge. He was a formerly enslaved man who um, fell on hard times. He was a, a journeyman in the community and could no longer afford uh, to sustain himself, couldn't sustain himself and ended up in the House of Industry Refuge. So there are these variations on obituaries for him, many of which include variations on the spelling of his name. So, you know, it's the same, the same figure, the same subject, but with a degree of uncertainty in, in terms of whether or not anyone really knew who he was and knew enough to, to get his name right. <laughs> He's also an interesting man because, or interesting figure in this regional history because he was a resident of the first schoolhouse in uh, the community. So there's an image that's kind of central to the constellation there. Um, you know, despite being uh, someone who had a presence in town, this is the only surviving image of him. And yet, you know, just to the right there, there's a group uh, portrait of the first, the, the, the living, last known living uh, pupils, right, of the, of the school. And, you know, for folks who know a little bit about this region and they read the listing of names there, almost all of those individuals have streets named after them in the city or the region, right? And that's one way, one tool that uh, communities will use to show who they value enough to remember. Um, there's also references to the city's namesake, to a referendum on its name. So the city was originally called Berlin, and uh, when it became unpopular to be associated with Germany, uh, residents called for a referendum on the city's name and voted in favor of changing the name to Kitchener. And for anyone who knows a little bit about history, they will know that was not a better choice. <laughs> Lord Kitchener was not a good man. And, um, and, you know, interestingly enough, in, I believe it was 2020, but I could be wrong about this, uh, that exact date, this, the city or members of the city, residents in the city, uh, started to organize a petition online to change the name of the city again. And it didn't, yeah, it was, it was either 2020 or maybe it was a year earlier. <laughs> My memory is fuzzy. But it was, it was recent, right? Um, and I love thinking about the power of petitions as democratic tools for communities to organize themselves to affect change. And a little bit later on, we're going to see what can happen when uh, petitions are not organized in the spirit uh, of, of collective hospitality, right? They take a different turn. We also have other constellations that allow us to kind of see a bit of a branching of that history, um, that early 20th century history. Go a little bit further back with the Haldeman um, constellation here that, uh, that gives us a sense of some of the indigenous roots in that area. And interestingly enough, a number of portraits of indigenous leaders that were critical to uh, the transfer of a tract of land from the Anishinaabe to the Six Nations. Um, and these portraits are all rendered in a style that we associate with col colonial leadership, right? It seems a bit of a kind of dissonant, dissonant in a sense. Um, and not necessarily respectful of uh, original inherent traditions within the community. There's also this constellation here in which Deanna's family appears, right? And this constellation is called Black Drones. And I want Deanna to maybe give us a little bit of sense of what 
the objectives of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so what is this? Um, Black Drones, this constellation is really a discussion about, uh, again, representation of blackness, the everyday people that you don't really think about in the making of history or thinking of a community, um, or, you know, the ways in which the Kitchener-Waterloo community, the Berlin community, was comprised of former slaves, like a different Levi, but this is another Levi, is a former slave that was living in this community. And, uh, these images matter to me a great deal because there was only one archive that I was actually able to get images from during the pandemic. It was the Ottawa, or sorry, the Ontario Archives. Um, and it just so happened that they were launching this project called the uh, Glam Project. And if you go to Wikipedia, you'll be able to find it again. And it was a moment when um, art community, art galleries were trying to figure out how do we get this material, this information about our collections, out to the community at this time, right? Nobody's coming into the archives, nobody's coming into the libraries. And so they started digitizing um, copyright cleared collections and putting it on Wikipedia for download. And one of the collections that they had offered up was one by a gentleman named Alvin McCurdy. Older black gentleman, maybe of my, say my grandmother's generation, maybe even my mom's generation, but with the wherewithal to know that the early images that he had of the black community that he grew up in would matter later. And so he, put the, he kept those and passed them on to the archive. They digitized them in the middle of the pandemic and they got me these images. And so this gentleman comes out of this crazy fortunate kind of an opportunity. Um, other images here, I'm working through a few things. I've got family, so this is my great-great-great-great-grandmother. <laughs> I had to think about that a little bit. That's Aurelia. Uh, and then these are my grandparents right here. This is my grandfather, this is my grandmother, my great-uncle, my aunt. I grew up with these people in the church. Um, and my grandfather was a deeply religious man, so fire and brimstone times about three or four times over by nature of his cousins and stuff like that. And I didn't have a chance in hell. But, you know, I, um, I tried, right? I literally did not have a chance in hell with these people, right? But I grew up in this history that was taught to me as being very important and how community and how everybody got along. And it was something really hard to believe when you kind of marry it with all of these other larger contextual images that shows that everybody was not getting along, right? But here, in this kind of le a level of a being, and when you're working on the farm, when you are, you know, in your day-to-day, -day, these people are not the ones that you're going to remember over time because they're just your everyday black laborer. But they're important to me because these everyday black laborers are my kin, right? And then they go on to do subsequently very large and important things just by their sheer survival. And so that's really what this reflects in this, in many ways for me here. But it's also got other images. There are images that are haunting and fearful, but they speak to perhaps the experiences that my family would not have uh, spoke to, right? The banning of our presence in the nation by Prime Minister Laurier, the blocking of the, of the ongoing migration of African Americans coming up during Red Summer and even the summers before. And, um, Red Summers, if you know what Red Summer is, it's literally uh, a year of high lynching. Um, and of course, that was going on early, pretty much from the 1900s onwards. And so my family was literally fleeing uh, an incredible phase of uh, lynching in Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And so the government didn't want us. And so that's part of this narrative that gets introduced here. These just these regular people that became something else, became synonymous with something that the nation did not want. Um, also in here, there's images that speak to Levi Carroll's uh, role as a soldier during the Civil War, which is again, hard to imagine that there would be a connection. Uh, and again, thinking through rep representation, this is an arc of uh, the possible kind of life cycle of a former slave going from the cotton field and then ultimately dying um, uh, as a kind of a, what would you say, a, um, a warrior on behalf of the, of the state, of a martyr? A martyr, yeah, yeah, as well. Um, but certainly somebody who had no good reason to be fighting with people that were, you know, uh, around slavery and, and the Civil War. 
uh, black bodies that were fighting in the war for the wrong side, uh, which introduces images like this one. This is a black gentleman who was working with, uh, or was shadowing the young man that he had been tasked to kind of live with and care for his entire life, and they are, he's a Confederate soldier, and working with him throughout that civil war and finding that just a bizarre task to, be, to uphold um, thinking through of other representations about how, you know, black bodies have been presented uh, after uh, emancipation and the ways in which that power dynamic between blacks and whites still pays out, plays out. Uh, and then, of course, thinking about, you know, this literally, this is um, a wagon trail of blacks that are pushing forward to the north uh, and recognizing that that is probably very much what my family looked like when they came. Uh, and so very much this constellation is about an opportunity for me to see, see them, right? Um, also, this house is my grandfather's side of the family that came through Kentucky and ultimately created a black town called Nicodemus. And this is one of the first homesteads uh, for that town. It still, it still exists. It's a black town in the middle of Kansas. Um, and then these images are taken in Alberta, in Amber Valley, which is the black community that they went and created in northern Alberta. And we are the northernmost black community in North America, still in existence. So there are references to land throughout this whole show. When as we move around, you're going to see some different perspectives on how... Um, how land is transformed. And in the constellation behind me that's titled Haldeman, that's kind of telling a story about the, the transformation, maybe just in law only, or in some version of a law, of uh, in, in land that um, is indigenous land and shifting, shifting stewardship, or not shifting stewardship, but a stewardship that stays with the community, the nation's community, despite uh, cities like Kitchener and Waterloo and Guelph and Hamilton showing up along this tract of land and erasing what that original stewardship looks like, at least in law. Um, we also have references to land and labor through the title of the exhibition. So the title of the exhibition is Black Drones in the Hive, and that's um, that's uh, language that was pulled from the archive, right, from uh, the Waterloo County Archive. And it was an assessment of a laborer who was living at the House of Industry and Refuge, a man named, Will, is it William Jaffrey? William Robinson? Robinson. It's Jaffrey that was the deputy reeve of the city at the time. Uh, and he describes this man, uh, Robinson, um, a black man, a journeyman in the town, as a perfect black drone in the hive, good for nothing but labor, basically, right? And, you know, as we move through the show, we are, we're going to see examples of, uh, or citations, of the history of black soldiers in the First World War through the Number 2 Construction Battalion. It was an all-black battalion, the only of its kind. Um, but, you know, those, those individuals were not given the opportunity to labor with their fellow soldiers at the front line. They were deemed good for clearing land and entertaining, right? So there's this, this kind of inequality that exists even within um, labor on the battlefield. I want to... Black and Indigenous labor on the battlefield. Um, I also want to, like, kind of connect us to a little bit of... Uh, uh, Kitchener history through that pedestal or the shelf with a book there on the end. Um, so that's a yearbook and you're, you might be wondering, well, what, what's the significance of this Kaufman building? And I'll tell you a little story about the uh, working <laughs> in galleries and museums. Sometimes when we're doing research in files, our collection files, we find weird things, we find things we don't expect to really understand until like years later. Um, we also find very thin files that don't tell us <laughs> anything. <laughs> and one day I was kind of leafing through uh, some of our kind of uh, files on um, the, the founding of the gallery and came across a list of names of founding fathers, so to speak. 
and, uh, or founding directors, and one was Alvin Kaufman, who was a well-known industrialist in, in the city, and he had this big factory that made boots and different uh, kind of rubberized footwear. Sorel boots were made there, and um, as it turns out, he was also a kind of champion of what was then called family planning in a very kind of noble, uh, a noble designation. But what that looked like was sterilizations of staff. So, and he's on forced sterilizations of staff. And so there are records wherein, you know, he's stated that uh, this was an effort to control his workforce, to uh, kind of eradicate the feeble-minded, again, in kind of air quotes, and uh, kind of less favorable humans that would be working um, on his, or in his factory. So it was, it was framed as a kind of public service. You know, we're going to offer this to you, but it's also a way to heavily control the kind of autonomy that individuals have over what their lives could look like and who their families could be. So do you want to walk around? At all. Yeah. Or who deserves to have a family at all? And again, all of this is still within that time frame that we're talking about at the beginning of this show, right? So this is still an extension of these discussions around eugenics and et cetera, et cetera, and the calling of a labor force. And so that, um, that very much is a factor of all of this. Yeah. Where did you want to go? Where are we going? The wars? Are we going to the wars? We didn't quite mention this section behind us, though. Okay, we're going to touch on it briefly. It's also the hardest co constellation, but behind us, of course, is a constellation that's directly about slavery. Um, and you'll notice that there are, are a pair of shackles in this pedestal. Um, they're the real deal. They're the real deal. Bought them on eBay in the middle of the pandemic. Bought a couple of pairs. Uh, really sweated about what to do about them, whether or not to include them at all. But I felt like it was important for you all to see them. Um, and then beyond that, just to make a couple of connections, um, it was important for me to be able to make a connection between those shackles and this image and be able to kind of see the kind of purposeful advertisement of these shackles, um, the inexpensive, well, they're not inexpensive, but relatively the way that it's kind of listed in amongst other kind of farm tools and just thinking that's just a perverse kind of co correlation. Um, Obviously, there's a depiction of the slave ships and, the perp and the, uh, a depiction of how many people, how many bodies you could fit on a ship if you had, like, you know, this kind of a makeup of the ship. This is a depiction in Harper's Weekly of Africans on board us on the deck of a slave ship and just looking again at the sheer density of bodies uh, and imagining what that could be like. Um, a hymn uh, that, or sorry, these are ads for slaves wanted, uh, so wanting to look at that. And this, again, is in Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Most people didn't believe the narrative that she had constructed, so she had to create a key for it so that people could actually back reference to the um, materials that she was referencing in the narrative itself. So that's that. Um, Will Smith, I know this is like a weird ass thing to say, but anyhow, Will Smith on his redemption tour post slapping at the Oscars, the first film he did was a film called, oh wow, what was the name of that film? Um, it's, I think it's Emancipation. I think, I think it's Emancipation. And it's based on this gentleman who was a real life person. So this is Whipped Gordon. Um, and it was actually a gentleman who had been so savagely beaten, the scars on his backs were photographed, and then the, there was a medical doctor that accompanied many of the, the um, Union side um, uh, troops, and he would document the slaves that were with them or, represent, or present themselves to them. And then they used that as an abolitionist card to kind of mass reproduce this, mass produce this image and then disseminate it as kind of a horror story about slavery itself. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention that's specific to the region is I found this um, newspaper ad, it's a classified ad in, uh, I can't remember which newspaper, but at the short of it, um, it's a call for the colored people, it's announcing that the colored people of Canada will celebrate at Berlin, Ontario on July 31st and August 1st, the emancipation of the West Indian slaves. The feelings in the minds of, these, of the freed race are such as no white man of the Western world can understand. Only he who has been a slave knows what freedom is. And I just thought that was super important to bring forward, right? So we, um, I just opened a, a project at the National Gallery on Emancipation Day, and it was just a truly 
amazing experience. The third time that Canada has done it federally. Um, so, yeah, that sentiment's pretty much spot on, I have to say. In this constellation, maybe more than any other one in the exhibition, there's the highest concentration of inverted images or redacted images. And I know that's a strategy that you use carefully, and it's one that folks often notice when they walk through the show. And they, one of the first questions I'll receive from visitors is, what? what's going on there? Like, why are some images inverted and others are not? I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why you do that, what, what the strategy is there. Um, it's too painful. Some of these images are just too, too hard. Um, some of it's about protecting characters in the photos. Just that. I think there was one over here. Was it over here? This image at the very end is a perfect example of an image that, in its positive, it does the job of what the original photographer wanted to do, which would it was ha it was an image of two white kids pointing at this black man, uh, and I can't. I think it's coon, coon, coon is what they're yelling at him, and so the composition, uh, as it was originally intended, really focuses all that energy at that black man and makes him look like a character, and but when you invert it. Those kids look like demons. <laughs> and, and I thought that that was actually the better place to put it because that's where the ill will resides in this image. It's not about him, it's about them. And it's, for me, anyhow, it's about that evilness that actually that they would even know how to do that. And so I wanted to flip that so that it put the perspective or to put the shift of the focus to where it should be. There are other images, say, what's in here? Of obviously, the slaves on the, on the deck of the ship in uh, the quote-unquote positive, it um, crushed me. And I just couldn't get my head around how I would put any, I, I just couldn't get my head around how I could put them out in the world unprotected, yeah? Uh, and the same with Whip Gordon. Um, and then in this instance, this is actually uh, a slave auction house that I thought, again, it did that job of really highlighting the text of the auction house in Negro sales. It wasn't quite as, uh, as apparent as it was uh, when it was in its positive. So sometimes it actually just kind of heightens the focus in some really kind of important ways. So that's what I was thinking through around all of that. Yeah. Did I catch all that on the microphone? I hope so. I hope you all heard that. Let's move around the corner. So one thing we didn't mention early on in the show is that to spend time with the show is also to notice that there's language that appears on labels and in work that may make you uncomfortable. In fact, I'm, I'm certain it will. It makes us uncomfortable. But it's important for us to keep that language intact in the framing of this exhibition, in the labels and information. Because, um, because a lot of that language still lives in the archive. In fact, sometimes you have to use that language to find images, to find how some of these images are actually labeled within the archive. Some of these images have had their names changed since. Like there's one image in this constellation called the Wars uh, that includes three uh, men from the number two construction battalion behind uh, armaments there. And uh, that has a pretty offensive title that in the last two years has been changed by the National Archives. Yes, if you find the image, it has a different title now. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that's, that's something we think about too. What kind of language appears alongside images in, in the archive? And how can language also uh, extend harm, right? This is where... You know, in a lot of our museum's archives, we're thinking about naming of artworks, right? And how they get their names. And artworks made in, you know, earlier than the 20th century, really, they're not necessarily going to have titles that were given to them by the artists. Sometimes those are titles, oftentimes those are titles that are assigned in the archives. So somebody is making a choice as to how to label uh, those images. Um, behind me is a constellation called Abolition, and to my right is a, an important work called Petition. There's also a case here with objects, some of which are souvenirs that point to that narrative of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And there are also references to the history of photography in here too. So you'll see an image of Sojourner Truth there, who 
is uh, a, a woman of great importance, or was a woman of great importance. She was an abolitionist who recognized uh, that there was value in, in mon not monetizing her image, but using her image to uh, propel her abolitionist cause. So she would sell these little carte de visite uh, reproductions of her image to fund abolitionist measures. So in a way, like, the way, like how the image of whipped uh, Gordon was used, um, Sojourner Truth undertook the same, uh, the same kind of efforts, except she was the one who was in control of her image. So she also copyrighted her own likeness, and that's a pretty uh, significant shift in copyright law in the United States. I believe that she was the first individual to copyright her own likeness. And Deanna's behind <laughs> So Deanna's going to share a few more thoughts in this room before we move around. I'm behind Crystal. Um, OK, let me think about this. In this constellation, you've also got things that are thinking through, are actually um, thinking through the Underground Railroad. This is a map of all of the known routes of the Underground Railroad and its interconnection between the United States and Canada. Uh, this is the British uh, abolition of slavery that precedes American uh, abolition of slavery by a good 30 years. Uh, I want to say that the distinction is that the British compensated slaveholders for the earnings loss, but I do that Americans did it as well in some states, but not all. Um, so that is one of the biggest distinctions. I would say then that the former plantation, the former British plantation owners, many of them took their earnings or the money that they got from the collapse of their plantations and they came to Canada and started their uh, industrial endeavors here. Yeah? Um, there's a couple of uh, abolitionist newspapers that came out of southern Ontario, The Voice of the Fugitive, uh, and then also the voice of the bondsman, uh, and then making reference also to the Provincial Freedman, which was uh, published by Marianne Shad uh, very, very early on, one of the first black women publishers uh, in Canada. Uh, this is actually a reference to her New York home, so she had another, another home in uh, the, that state, so I wanted to just flag her kind of urban relationships, and this is, of course, as uh, um, Abraham Shad, her Grant, her father, uh, who is of course on a Canadian stamp. In here also, the this is the stamped slave, it's, um, what do we call it, the branded hand? Which is uh, um, an abolitionist hand, which has been stamped with an SS to uh, point to the fact that he is an abolitionist and to, and to basically flag him. Um, a kind of punishment, so to speak, for being an abolitionist. John Brown, uh, is in here a few times. Now, when we think about uh, the Civil War, we many of us think that that is kind of started in, I don't know what, what the historically documented determined first battle is, but many think that the attack on Harper's Ferry is in fact the most important battle to start. And that is a battle that happened on, uh, that was conceived in Chatham, Ontario. Uh, by John Brown, um, and if you know anything about that, I mean, it really was a very important um, battle that was the precursor to the Civil War. Then this notion of this ongoing kind of entity of John Brown as this uh, ab abolitionist savior that keeps coming up through history. But I wanted to flag, too, that there were Canadian abolitionists. These are gentlemen that were in Toronto. We had a Canadian abolitionist society. Uh, and then this is John Brown's house in Chatham, so it still exists there in Ontario. Uh, and I think, of course, the most important thing is knowing that Canada, being on the other side of, of the border, there was a high um, concentration of fugitive slaves coming into the province. And so you would often find signs like this telling slaves that the slave hunters were amongst us. And it's as a means to let people know that they should take cover, uh, take care. Over here, you've got kind of tchotchkes. It's the best I got for you. <laughs> um, but they're interesting to me in the ways in which one is like this kind of commodification of Uncle Tom's Cabin through this really horrid little plate that I thought was interesting. And then the Wedgwood um, plate in the center is an abolitionist plate. This is a reproduction, but it too I bought on all of these things on eBay. The Harriet uh, Beecher Stowe first, cap um, first copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin, eBay, eBay, all of this is eBay, which is 
weird. And then again, there is this pictorial of scenes in the Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, narrative that are put onto plates and just fascinated with this kind of ongoing kind of depiction of the black body, none of it honorific necessarily, weird and not human at the same time, but I thought it was important to bring these all forward. In the war character, in this war segment, there's a few things that matter. One, I have a family member that fought in the number two construction battalion, so it was important to name that. Um, Again, a descendant from the Amber Valley community choosing to fight for a country that did not want them to fight at all. Um, I bring it forward also because of, we talk about that disappearance of the bust of Wilhelm I and how it all has been attributed to the company B in this group then of the, oops, there's a speaker over there, 118th um, Waterloo Battalion. These British soldiers are, the, are said to have taken that bust and thrown it into the water in a fit of kind of anti-German violence. Um, there's other things that I think are interesting in here. Black gentlemen, that black soldiers for the War of 1812. Uh, these are gentlemen, uh, when Crystal was referring to this notion of black soldiers as entertainment, these are the, this is the jazz band, the recruitment band for the number two construction battalion. And the gentleman with the horn in particular had taken the horn. He was gifted the horn when he was playing, and then when he was no longer enlisted, he took the horn because it was his horn, right? Except that he got written up for taking it because the army had argued that he had stolen it, and it became this whole thing. So that documentation is in this constellation as well. And then there's uh, speaking very specifically to um, indigenous warriors, uh, indigenous gentlemen, uh, sir, um, indigenous um, Oh, what's the um, army, but oh, my language is going, what do you, no, um, when you serve, I mean, what do you, oh, never, anyhow, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, just thinking about, um, no, forget it, anyhow, it's, it's, gone. <laughs> it's gone, but th thinking about indigenous people that were fighting, again, for the Canadian government also did not see a lot of uh, the battlefront, but at the same time, what was happening during the First World War is that the potlatch ban was still happening, but Canada would have uh, indigenous um, servicemen put on their full regalia abroad to illustrate this kind of super inclusive you know, Canadian um, battalion, but in fact, if they were to wear that regalia back at home, they would have been imprisoned, and the irony of that, right? So it's really kind of a, a mishmash of, of that, of the indigenous and black warriors, but then it's got some other things that are smattered in between it. Lauren Harris, uh, Vincent Massey uh, were also part of the war, neither fought. Um, in fact, they are both, they were po both part of the same battalion, um, married by industry, if you know the um, Massey Hart uh, agricultural um, legacy. So two different, two different families, but married through that industrial connection. And of course, Lauren Harris and Vincent Massey are, you know, critical core members of the Group of Seven. But then seeing how they managed to get through the war in the back end, Lauren Harris had a Heart, um, a nervous breakdown because his brother had uh, died in the war. And so he sat it out at Hart House in the basement painting backdrops for other uh, w uh, soldiers. Um, when, of course, all of these black and indigenous people are out here trying to fight for the country and are, you know, have no reason to be there. And yet there they are risking their lives. And then these very wealthy, uh, connected gentlemen have managed to extricate themselves from it altogether. Um, so I wanted to name that. Um, there's a bit of a mention of the, um, what are we going to call it, the heroes of the Boer, the South, South African heroes, speaking of the Boer War, which gets us back to Kitchener, um, evil warlord Kitchener, who actually had introduced concentration camps into the war game long before Hitler ever did in South Africa, and, and Kitchener introduced that in South Africa. And so it's interesting that Hitler is, is kind of carrying that mantle when in fact it's the British that introduced that kind of inhumane approach to scorched land and running people off the land that of course is brought back to Canada and is the very same practice that we did to clear the land here. You know, one of the um, 
one of the kind of quiet gifts of this exhibition is how we think about attribution and how we think about you know what significant achievements are attached to specific individuals. So, you know, I think it's we see a kind of a reverence given to a figure like John Brown for his role in the planning of the Harper's Ferry attack. Yet Harriet Tubman was there. <laughs> in fact, she's attributed as like the architect of in retroactively the architect of that attack, right? The first attack military attack planned on American soil by a woman, and an, a fugitive woman at that, right? And Harriet Tubman ended her final uh, underground railroad attempt. Sorry. Uh, Harriet Tubman actually ended her last um, underground railroad runs, if you want to call that, in Canada, right? She actually ret retired in Canada. Another kind of significant slavery abolitionist kind of figure that is not attributed to our history whatsoever. About that. I mean, I remember um, I gave a tour of this exhibition when it was in Regina, and um, there was a, a person on the tour who was somewhat incredulous, and he said to me, well, we didn't have slavery in Canada. <laughs> and I'm like, well, we just built a show around it, <laughs> but, you know. Um, but he, he's, it was interesting because in his statement, it was almost as though he was trying to convince himself, right? Like, I, I felt like that statement was not for me, it was for him. And, and, you know, I think there's a lot that we don't know about our history, all of us, that we don't know about our history, which is, you know, slowly revealed to us in a project uh, like this. But also, you know, what do we stand to gain by not believing that an institution like slavery existed in Canada? And in fact, there are uh, references to uh, to that history and a first first person accounts of that history in um, one one object in this case the Benjamin Drew collection of uh, autobiographical narratives there's um, the title page for that book is on the far left of this constellation and that also plays a role in what we think of as the punctuation of the show the final work in the show which we'll get to in a moment but we'll quickly zip through uh, the video room and then move through the, we'll move past the, the petition, unless you want to talk about the petition now. Okay, okay, let's do that. <laughs> Since you're here. Um, so, Crystal had mentioned petitions before uh, and um, really in many, many ways my practice has kind of taken this, this shift um, at the advent of this piece. Now, I made this project uh, 2013, I think I made it first, and it was a different in a different context. But what this is is it's a piece called the 1911 Anti Creek Negro Petition. Um, it is a petition that was generated by members of the boards of trade in Alberta, primarily um, Minister of Interior Frank Oliver, who was. Um, deeply racist man who was adamant that a wave of black indigenous people coming from Indian territory in the 1910s should not come. What he did was rally the boards of trade, they came together, they created this petition. The argument of it largely is that there is a wave of black Indians coming into the country you need to stop them from coming because if you don't, I mean, well, the argument was that they're not uh, were not uh, able to work the land, that the climate was too cold. I mean, a bunch of like stereotypes that are a hot mess of like not true, but, um, and then finished off that, that whole plea with, and if you, don't, if you don't stop this, then we'll oblige to resort to law, uh, mob violence, which again is lynching, right? Now, it is a petition that was generated particularly in response to the migration of my community coming from Indian territory. Um, what makes it more kind of, did I lose this? I hope I didn't lose. Uh, it, the petition was sent to Prime Minister Laurier and is the only documented case in which blacks were presented from coming into the country. So that there was an ordering council that was generated that argued that we were um, deemed unsuitable to the terrain um, and that uh, Order and Council never stuck formally, but it stuck informally for a good 55 years at the border via a number of kind of immigration uh, policies, largely health-related, that kept blacks coming in until the 1960s with um, uh, 
um, British Caribbeans that came to work as nurses and medical professionals in the middle provinces. So in between that and us is a big old void of no black people. Um, and so it mattered to bring it forward. One, just out of my own kind of sheer shock and amazement, it certainly undoes the narrative that my family told us about everybody getting along on a local level, which actually is true because the harshness of the train did require that kind of interconnectedness, but the hostility that my family had met, our community had met, was murderous. Um, and again, it speaks to a kind of an understanding of the country that most people don't have. Um, and I thought it was important to bring these names to the forefront. These are people that are proud to sign their name, give their addresses, you know, their profession. They are firmly behind these ideas. And if you look at the petition in another way, it's a community of like-minded individuals who came together to support a particular cause, as we always do with the petition. It just happens to be that this petition was specifically designated to keep a, a community of people out. Um, and it has very long-term uh, effects. So this, as an example, is one of the things that has given me clear insight into my family's experience and what they were trying to keep from us, what they were trying to kind of will away for the next generations. Um, and then for me, on the other side of it, this provides me as an opportunity to just really understand things that deeply affected their psyche. And these things do deeply affect obviously, one psyche. Um, and it's become part of the generational work that I've done, and this is what the exhibition does as well. Maybe we'll just kind of draw folks' attention to the audio that is typically audible yeah. in this gallery. It's, it's down a little bit. Um, we, we have a, a prompt. <laughs> We're gonna hear the audio in a second. And so there are two soundtracks that kind of introduce both a mel one introduces a melody and the other introduces um, a rhythm to the space so we have uh, Charles Ellison who is you can hear it now who's playing taps for us and taps is usually played in one of two contexts like at the end of scout service uh, if the day's activities are done you may hear this uh, this dirge or this this melody, and its other name is day day is done, or it's otherwise known as day is done. But you would also hear it at military funerals, and uh, for anyone who has a family association with the military, you'll know that there is a kind of common understanding that one's service as a soldier is only ever complete when when you pass on, when your life is over, that you're a soldier, your whole life. And Deanna had the good fortune to work with Charles in Montreal and your kin folk, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? My favorite, my favorite book on the whole planet is uh, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Um, Charles, I moved to Montreal in, what, 2020, July 2020, something like that, and I was working on a different project and I needed a horn player and enter Charles Ellison. Somebody had thought he was a good idea for me to work with him. And um, I'm like, you're not related to Ralph Ellison. And he starts to give me this smile and sure enough, he's related to Ralph Ellison. So I'm like, oh my God, you're like God. <laughs> you're related to my favorite person in the whole world. But then it turns out he's also from Tulsa. And okay, Tulsa is like 30 minutes away from where my family came from in Indian territory. So we bonded over that. And he performed the dirge, we did the thing, and at the end of it, I was like, you know, I mean, he's an incredible horn player. He's played with some of the biggest jazz performers on the planet. He's raised like Branford Marsalis. He's like real deal. And I'm like, did you ever hear about this little nightclub called the Harlem Nocturne? Back in the day, my family had a jazz club in Vancouver. It was the only nightclub, the only black nightclub in Vancouver at Maine and Hastings. It was the place for any black performer to go. And I'm like, you know, Charles, do you actually, do you ever know anything about that? And he's like, oh yeah, I know that place. And he's like telling me these stories about the nightclub, but I'm just like amazed that this for good fortune of landing in this city and landing here with this guy who I had never met before and somebody else asked him to perform and he actually is virtually kin. And it was like a big sign to me that he needed to be in the project. So I continue to work with him. 
Um, and I continue to find connections to the Ellison family again. And so it just was a really beautiful connection. And he's just, it just so happens to be that he was working at Concordia University and I had moved to Montreal to work at Concordia. So it all seemed to be like this beautiful moment coming together. And he's just this perfect marker um, that does this beautiful riff off of taps that takes it to another place. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing that connects with this other sound that's over here that you may or may not be able to hear, but there's a, hall, there's a hallway down here and there's a parabolic speaker. And my very good friend Archer Pachau has performed an eagle song for me. And it is in, in relationship to two oral histories, one by a woman named Sof uh, Sophia Pooley, who was a former slave who actually was Joseph, Chief Joseph Brandt's uh, slave. And you might remember him from the Haldeman constellation. And that kind of undoes this other thing around black and indigenous solidarity or this notion that there never was anything else going on between the communities. But the reason that I'm here, I imagine speaking about black indigenous connection is largely around the indigenous enslavement of black bodies like Sophia's. And so it brings forward that conversation and complicates the relationship, certainly. But it does speak to the things that were happening in the time. It speaks to the ways and the, prob the probable reasons why my family has an indigenous lineage at all, right? So when you go over here, you're gonna hear this eagle song that will uncover you while you're reading Sophia's testimony about her experiences. And then after that, you're gonna read another testimony by another, another gentleman that speaks about witnessing all of these black townships and, and settlements that were at the under, end of the Underground Railroad and how the land was being seized from them because they couldn't do the numbers they couldn't read or they couldn't write, they couldn't do math. And so white colonial settlers were taking the land from them. So all of those black, re those black settlements are gone. And what exists in Southern Ontario uh, is Buxton and maybe about five of the original 35 black towns are now all gone and they're replaced by these big new cities. There's a bit of connective tissue between Sophia and the petition, too, in the form of some images that may be familiar to folks in the community. So you're, you're going to see a small salon arrangement of paintings, small studies, mar mainly kind of landscape studies that are, appear to be unoccupied. And that's part of a kind of a mythic margin that exists between Sophia's reality and the petition, in a sense, this idea that a landscape was too hostile for particular humans. And in, in the case of those paintings by G7 painters, like that's part of myth making, right? That's, this land couldn't possibly be hospitable enough to black bodies, but it also erases indigenous livelihoods and history on that land too, right? By nature of the paintings, by nature of the, like the myth making around a kind of terra nullius idea, which has only until like recently <laughs> been rescinded by, by the Catholic Church too, right? So this idea that no, that, that kind of um, uh, imagining our, our homeland that way is, is not only deeply problematic, but it, it's not honest, right? It doesn't tell the whole story. And, you know, one of the reasons why there is that kind of connective tissue between the petition and, uh, and Sophia through those paintings is there is a group of seven connection to the petition, right? So in the first time the exhibition, first time uh, Deanna's petition was shown at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, it was in an exhibition in 2017. And uh, the registrar at KWEG, uh, wonderful, deeply detailed person. Registrars are, so wherever you are, thank your collection manager <laughs> and archivist. Um, noted a name that was familiar to us and she came to me and she said, oh, we, like, we gotta do, we gotta talk. <laughs> and she had found the name of uh, a man named Barker Fairley as a signatory on the petition. He's on page eight, top row, top left. Um, and Barker Fairley was, known a bit as a painter, primarily in Ontario, but he was better known uh, 
as a champion of the group of seven. So there's a really famous photograph of the group sitting at the Arts and Letters Club, and there at the table with them is, is Barker Fairley, right? So how do we like hold all of this in our hands and our minds at the same time? Like how do we make sense of these complex histories? And that's that's part of that's part of our responsibility as as people moving through the world today in an era where you know all of this is essentially available to us, right? And I guess the thing with the Barker Fairley is my logic with that was well, if Barker Fairley is signing a petition that's calling for the lynch mob killings of Black Indigenous people, well, what does that mean about the Group of Seven work that he's supporting with these landscapes that are void of Indigenous and Black bodies or any of the industry, all of this, all of this, I should mention, save for that petition, all of this is generated in the area in which the G7 paintings are largely painted, right? Um, Lauren Harris was born in Brantford, would have known full well what that history is about, right? Um, Vincent Massey, also Southern Ontario, would have known a great deal about it, largely through his own role as a politician. Um, in, in uh, the Ontario government. But more, really, it's like, it's an interesting thing to think about all of the things that contribute to the making of a nation, the things that are excluded from the making of a nation, uh, and how all of these things, the good and the bad, I really hate to say it, but these things are all integral to that practice of creating a place for some and maybe not for others um, in these idealistic ambitions towards building a country, right? Um, I'm really glad that you all came out here tonight. We're very attentive, and um, I know that we burned your brain with a lot of information. I know it because they got the look, Crystal. They got, <laughs> they got the look. Um, but I'm so glad that you listened and you took the time to hear us out. And some of it might stick. There's a lot of it that might go right over your head. But um, come back and read uh, if you're inclined to that kind of thing. I know COVID did a number on so many of us with the reading thing. Um, and I know it might hurt a little bit, but it's, uh, it's an important thing to reckon with as we move forward. And I think that's all I got for you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.